Good day once again. I'm at Highland here at the Big Ideas Theater at AARC Congress, and I'm joined now by Neil McIntyre from Duke University. Doesn't need an introduction. We see you every year. Good to see you again, Neil. Ed, it's a delight to be back, and you're right. Uh, we do seem to meet every <laughs> we, we do seem to meet every year, but it's fun because we get to talk about topics that are kind of hot at the uh, at the meeting. Now you've got a couple of different sessions, yeah. but we wanted to kick it off by talking about one uh, that uh, you're having a lot of fun with: uh, permissive hypoxemia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, respiratory therapy has been involved for its history in trying to improve oxygenation and get CO2 down. And we've learned over the years that sometimes the cost to the patient in terms of harm uh, is excessive for, for instance, driving the CO2 down or raising the PO2 up. And so this notion has come along first with carbon dioxide of permissive uh, hypercapnia. Let the CO2 rise and protect the lung. And the latest iteration on this is permissive hypoxemia. Let the PO2 fall if it protects the lung. Now, what are we protecting the lung from? We're protecting the lung from high levels of inspired oxygen. We are creatures designed to breathe 21% oxygen, and as you raise that, the potential for harm goes up. Uh, with ventilators, we may want to use large minute ventilations or large levels of uh, expiratory pressure to try to drive the PO2 up and this can harm uh, the lung as well. So we're doing balancing acts in this profession. And what I'm gonna be talking about at this meeting uh, are ways to address how to take care of the patient while allowing the PO2 to fall. As the title of your talk is, yeah. is suggesting, Hence, how low can you go? How <laughs> low can you go? And um, the thrust of my talk is first to uh, describe why we're doing this, but secondly, then to look at ways we can approach the patient. Um, maybe going beyond just the level of oxygen in the blood, looking at things like oxygen consumption, maybe lowering that, looking at things like oxygen delivery with hemoglobin and with cardiac output manipulations to improve that without having to necessarily push the arterial level of PO2 up. So there are things we can do to uh, address oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption. Uh, a second area that uh, there's a lot of research going on is trying to uh, direct uh, the oxygen that you do have to the right areas. In, in other words, your skin, when you're really sick, doesn't need a whole lot of oxygen. Maybe yours does. But, <laughs> but Breathe. <laughs> but there are organs that don't need as much uh, oxygen. When you're lying in bed, the skeletal muscles don't need as much oxygen. At the same time, there are other organs where oxygen delivery is critically important, like the brain and like the heart and probably the gut too. So um, maybe we can find ways to direct what oxygen delivery we have to areas that are uh, particularly in need of oxygen. And so directing the oxygen and monitoring, for instance, brain oxygenation, monitoring gut oxygenation, and focusing on those important regions rather than the more global uh, oxygen delivery you, you can calculate from a blood gas. So, so getting kind of focused. And then um, uh, taking uh, or trying to learn how the body itself deals with hypoxemia is fascinating. Um, the, the body has the capability of actually extracting more oxygen from the blood it's getting. And how, how can we help the body do that? What are things we can do to help this extraction phenomenon? The class, so uh, there are, uh, uh, there is a lot of research in looking at that. And then what I think is probably the most exciting is looking at uh, what's called hypoxia inducible factors. And these are things in the cells that actually do a whole host of uh, manipulations on cellular uh, biochemical reactions and cellular metabolism to deal with very, very low oxygen levels. And a classic example uh, is um, people living at altitude. Um, they tolerate PO2 values much lower than you and I have, and they do fine, and they do fine. And there are compensatory mechanisms. Um, yes, they breathe a higher minute ventilation. Yes, they have a higher cardiac output. Um, but there's more to it than that. They're able to deal with the hypoxic environment better. And climbers going to Everest, another classic example. And they go to the base camp for weeks 
And the reason they're at the base camp is it's about, I forget, 15, 18,000 feet, but it's designed to get their bodies to adapt to this very, very low oxygen tension on top of Mount Everest. The PO2 on Mount Everest is in the teens. It would kill you and me, but yet people have been on the top of Mount Everest without oxygen and thriving. The Sherpas so, have lived there for, for centuries. It's, it, exactly right. The Sherpas can teach us a lot. And the other one, the other one that absolutely fascinates me is the fetus. In utero, the human being has a PO2 in the 30s, and yet it's growing and developing and maturing and thriving with a PO2 in the 30s. Yes, they have fetal hemoglobin, but there's more to it than that. The cells in the fetus uh, are able to deal with these very, very low oxygen tensions. They are able to extract things better. They are able to use the oxygen that's available better. And we need to understand that. And I mean, it's gonna sound trite, but you almost wanna take people in the ICU and turn them into fetuses <laughs> and then stick them on Mount Everest. Uh, if, if only there was a way. If only there was a way. Uh, so, I mean, I'm obviously being a little simplistic here, but uh, I, th I think there's a very fascinating future in, uh, in this world of uh, oxygen delivery, oxygen extraction, oxygen utilization. And if we can tap into what Sherpas do, to what climbers on Everest do, to what the human fetus does, uh, I think we could go a long way to uh, protecting our patients from unnecessary exposures to oxygen and ventilator pressures. Well, I'm sure somebody can come up with a study to get uh, respiratory therapists and uh, maybe hematologists together and, and head up to Mount Everest and see what kind of well, data we can, we can collect. Ed, Ed you're, you're spot on because there have been several expeditions to Everest uh, trying to do this. Uh, my own institution at Duke, uh, we have a very large hyperbaric chamber, but it's also a hypobaric chamber. And we can simulate Mount Everest uh, in the laboratory uh, and try to understand how the body acclimates. You can't do it in one day. This is something that takes some time. These, these, the, the, these changes in metabolism and these changes in the biochemistry um, take time, but they can happen. But they can happen. And uh, uh, the next generation of respiratory therapists um, are going to perhaps be taking their oxygen tanks and moving them to the side and instead looking at ways of manipulating the patient to need less of it. Well, it sounds like a fascinating ses uh, it, session, permissive hypoxemia, that's uh, gonna be coming up. Uh, it's gonna be great fun. Neil, you've got uh, so many things going on here at AARC Congress. Uh, looks like permissive hypoxemia is gonna be a, a real gem for a lot of people. Give us some thoughts on, on the other sessions you're gonna be dealing sure, with. Sure, Ed, yeah. I do have my finger in a fair number of pies here. Uh, a fun topic, actually it's gonna be Friday morning, uh, with Bobcat, my good friend Bob Kasmerick is debating different approaches and ways of trying to protect the lung from that physical stretch injury, what we call ventilator-induced lung injury. And should we be monitoring volumes or pressures or something else or some combination of the two? So I think that'll be a lot of fun and Bob is always fun to uh, debate. Uh, a second topic is on uh, uh, an institute called the Respiratory Compromise Institute. And this is a group that's been formed uh, to look at patients who have unexpected respiratory deterioration in the hospital. This can be from emboli, it could be from infection, it could be from fluid overload, it can be from a variety of different things. And trying to characterize who these patients are, identifying the high-risk patient, and coming up with monitors that will help avoid these kinds of catastrophes in the hospital. So we're gonna be updating uh, the, the audience on uh, some of the projects being done by the Respiratory Compromise Institute. And my uh, last project is, uh, uh, it's a breakfast meeting uh, in uh, basically looking at the home care arena. Uh, patients who are in need of ventilation, uh, ventilators, and in need of, of other high-level respiratory care uh, equipment in the home, and how best to uh, get it to them, how best to uh, teach them how to use it, the important role of respiratory therapists in this whole, uh, in, in this whole operation and the barriers that currently exist. So I think that'll be a fun breakfast as well. well so it's gonna be fun. We always enjoy your sessions and you bring so much to the table. I wanna thank you so much for joining us here in the Big Ideas Theater once again. Ed, always a pleasure. See you next year. Neil McIntyre, thanks again. And thank you for joining us here in the Big Ideas Theater at AARC Congress.